Hello, I'm Dwayne Cardall, and welcome to what some people might call my ego trip. Essentially, it's my story about my transition from a typical over 30 overweight sedentary American male to an athlete. But it's not my story alone. I'm merely an example of what's happening to millions of Americans today, people who are becoming physically fit. My rediscovered sport is running and a challenging event called the marathon. In many ways, the morning of July 24th, 1978, was like a dream. 1,100 people were gathering in the mountains east of Salt Lake City, preparing to run a 26-mile, 385-yard marathon, and I was among them. I say a dream because a year before, I had had difficulty running for five minutes. Now I was about to test my endurance for more than three and a half hours. The air was brisk despite daily 100 degree temperatures in the valley below. That's why we were starting so early, to avoid the heat, which is the marathoner's most dreaded adversary. But at the appointed hour of 6 a.m., we stood shivering as the start was delayed. Traffic in East Canyon was jammed and many runners had not yet arrived. It was a time for nervous joking, for exchanging tales of past races, and for sharing ubiquitous excuses for not being ready. To listen to runners before a race is to wonder why they're not all in a hospital healing their maladies instead of preparing to run. I had my excuses too. My wife had just given birth to our seventh child three days before, and I had had very little sleep during those ensuing days, and I felt weakened by a sore throat and summer cold. But this was the day I had looked toward for an entire year, and any excuse was merely perfunctory. I remembered last Pioneer Day. Something clicked as I read news accounts about the Deseret News Marathon. The adrenaline began flowing, and I got all excited. Next year, I told myself, I'm going to run that race. But how to go about doing it? Talking about running a marathon is easy. Doing it is another matter. I decided to visit Scott Bringhurst. He holds the record for the Deseret News Marathon, and I figured if anybody could tell me how to train, Scott would be the one. Five minutes right now might be a good base for you. And starting out jogging five minutes every day or every other day. One thing you want to make sure you do is that you're not going hard every single day. Your body needs a chance to recover, and you might even want to go out like four days a week. Scott advised me to gradually increase my running time by about 10% each week. Anything beyond that, he said, could result in injury and discouragement. Although I knew I wanted to begin running, and I had made a preliminary commitment to start, the first steps were very difficult. I procrastinated an entire month. Tomorrow always seemed like a better day, but finally on August 24th, 1977, tomorrow arrived. I found myself with my three daughters in Murray Park, dressed in an old knit shirt and gym shorts with a pair of thrift store running shoes on my feet. Just five minutes, I told myself, that should be easy. After all, I had been a fairly decent miler and distance runner in high school. Running was my game. Five minutes shouldn't take much effort in spite of 15 years of relatively little physical activity. Five minutes of that, you got it. 26 miles is going to be impossible to do. We'll make it. We'll make it. Okay, are you ready? Get set! Hey, this is a bit hard! This is a bit hard! The start of the race came 45 minutes late, and on a hot day, that could make quite a difference. The sun was now rising above the mountaintops in East Canyon as 1,100 runners began the three and a half mile ascent of Big Mountain. <music> 1,100 runners, more than double the number who started this race a year ago. Running has caught on. 
All across the country, races like this one are doubling in size each year as people discover what one author has described as the joy of running. Fashion designers have incorporated the running look into their latest creations. Books on running regularly appear on bestseller lists. Newspaper and magazine articles regularly appear to help satisfy the insatiable appetite runners have for information about their sport. Dr. George Sheehan and Joe Henderson have been at the very core of the running boom and have had as much influence on the direction the sport is going as anyone. I discovered early in this game that running is what runners like to do best, so we set out for a romp through Liberty Park. Dr. Sheehan is a cardiologist by profession who says he discovered running at age 45 and that changed his life. Now he's acclaimed as the runner's guru, the high priest of the road. He's a philosopher and a writer whose medical advice and running philosophy are faithfully accepted by millions of followers. Of course, Sheehan is philosophical about the running boom. I think it's, a, it's simply a matter that we've become aristocrats. And uh, I think that's what we, we become thinkers rather than knowers. We become participants rather than spectators. We become doers rather than consumers. Unlike Sheehan, Joe Henderson has always been a runner and a writer. As an editor of Runner's World magazine, the Bible of Runners, Henderson is a primary force in the running boom. I sort of uh, have mixed feelings about the whole running boom, to tell you the truth. I think that, uh, that some of running has been taken away from the runners. Running is being treated like, one, like the newest fad, like the hula hoops and the so on and so forth. And, and I, uh, I think running is too important at least it's too important to me to be treated this way, and it's, I think it's, many runners feel the same. The biggest boom right now is among women as they discover that they too can run. Dr. Joan Olyot is one of the nation's top female marathoners and a vocal advocate of women's running. When I started running in 71, I didn't think it was physically possible. Why didn't you think it was physically possible? Well, you see, I'd never seen a woman run except Wilma Rudolph in the Olympics, and she obviously had been trained from a kid. and. Uh, but I'd never seen an ordinary woman run. Now you just see hundreds and thousands of ordinary women out there running, so the average woman thinks, well, if she does it, then I can do it. By the time I reached Big Mountain Summit, the sun was high in the sky. The day would be extremely hot, so even though I wasn't thirsty, now was the time to drink. Vital body fluids were already being expended, and to avoid stopping to drink now could mean disaster later. The front runners were already nearly down the other side of Big Mountain. They had traversed the steep swishbacks that pound and jar the legs and often cause injury. My plan was to hold back a bit to avoid the temptation to turn loose on the steep downhill. Every bit of energy conserved now might help me to survive the crucial final miles when the body is exhausted and energy supplies are virtually spent. It's these mountains at an elevation of 7,000 feet that make the Deseret News Marathon one of the most difficult in the country. Joe Henderson ran it once four years ago and says he won't run it again. It was a great experience. I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, but, uh, that but. The 18, <laughs> but the 18 miles, the 16 to 18 miles of downhill running, I think left me sore for about two months. After a typical marathon, you're sore for two or three days. This one was like two months. So I think the downhill running is, uh, is probably the hardest thing on you physically. This day, the swishbacks began to take their toll. As I came off the mountain and continued along the much leveler grade of Highway 65, I began to feel a twinge in my left knee. I'd only gone seven miles, an easy training run on any other day. And yet, for some reason on this day, my legs had felt every step. That great human shock absorber, the knee, was beginning to break down. With 19 miles to go, I seriously began wondering if my year of dreaming, planning, and training would fall short of my goal to complete a 26-mile, 385-yard marathon. 